Um, I think the best way to introduce myself is to introduce you to my family. So could you move the slide over for me? Brilliant. There they are. Um, so that's that's me in the middle, uh, the guy with the red shirt, and to the right of me, that's uh, sorry, yeah, to the right of me uh, is uh, my wife, and the back row, uh, those are our birth children. So um, the lad on the far uh, left is uh, now 16, the lad on the far right is 15, and Anna is now 30. Uh, this is a slightly out of date photo, um, but I'm, I'm not happy to show any more recent photos because both of my boys and my daughter nearly are taller than me. And uh, so that, that's not a good thing that you want to promote around the world. Um, and it's, it's great for them, it's really good that they're taller than me. It makes life a little bit difficult for me when I'm disciplining them like this. But I tell them that the, the sad thing about being tall is that you don't enjoy the privileges uh, that short people do on aeroplanes. You know, we, we get free business class. It's called economy. <laughs> and uh, you know, who needs lots of leg when you're short, right? Anyway, so that's, uh, that's uh, our birth family. Uh, we had three children in three years, and we were just about 30. And uh, there was a cunning plan afoot in our decision uh, to have family that way. Um, I was reckoning I would be really sad when my kids leave home. Are there any people who have had children leave home here? Is it, is it as bad as I think it's going to be? Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm just nervous I'm going to really miss them. And I'm a kind of rip the bandage off quickly kind of guy. So I figured, okay, um, if they're going to leave home, they might as well leave home roughly together. And uh, so let's have the kids as quickly as possible. And uh, they think of it kind of silver lining, can't they? That when our kids leave home, our empty nest could become a love nest again. Just me and my wife, you know, we'll have long romantic strolls in the countryside. We'll go on those city breaks that kind of couples are supposed to do, you know, cruises. Like we never did when it was just me and my wife. But never mind, this next phase of life, well, well, that's where we'll be. And, uh, and then Miriam, my wife, had a, uh, had a brilliant idea. She said, why don't we become foster parents? And I thought, excellent idea for other people. That's just not us, you know, that's going to spoil all my plans. Uh, we, we move through the kind of diaper stage and the, the you know, potty training and, and, and taking kids to school and parent-teachers consults. We'll be through that. Why would we want to go back and do that again? Okay. That spoils my plans. Um, and my wife's a lovely, gracious woman, and she's incredibly patient. And so she kind of just dropped that seed of an idea in my head. Um, but the problem is, every time I opened the Bible, I came across a God who describes himself as a father to the fathers and a protector of widows and orphans. Uh, and once you, you, you see that, you kind of see it everywhere. Um, I, 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 Iggy and I, we were traveling out today, and um, we noticed on the front of a lot of the vehicles in Abbotsford, Above the lights, there's a kind of black strip. Have you, have you noticed that? Um, I've never seen it before, and Iggy had never seen it before. I pointed it out, and within what, five minutes, we saw three or four others. Um, does anyone know what it's for? Why is there a black strip on the top of You don't know. Okay, fine. I'd like to know. But you will notice it now that I pointed it out, okay? I've spoiled cars for you then, because you'll just be driving down the road and you go, oh, we can spoil that then. That's what happened to me when my wife dropped the idea into my head that we should consider fostering. Um, I suddenly opened up scripture in a different way, and I realized this was something that God is passionate about, and so we had to do it. And uh, we became foster parents, we went through kind of training and assessment from our local authority, and then we became foster parents. Our first foster placement was a little girl, and uh, she came to us straight from the hospital, and mum had a number of different um, kind of psychological and addiction issues in her life, and then um, they, they the local authority knew, the provincial government knew that um, she was not going to be able to look after this new baby, and so the baby came to us four days old. And uh, we fell in love with her and, and, and learned to her as best we could. And then the kind of happy thing was that mum was in a better place, and so the provincial government thought, well, oh, okay, let's try the baby with mum again. And uh, we were heartbroken, but we said goodbye, at least it's a happy ending. And then it broke down again, and the little girl came to be with us. And uh, our provincial government said, look, this child has had so much trauma, so much attachment, broken attachment. Is there any way that you would consider adopting her? And we said, of course we would. We'd be delighted. And so the little girl with the big hair, uh, that 
that's our adoptive daughter, and uh, she's delighted to be adopted. That is a uh, key part of her identity. She knows all about it, and uh, she thinks it's very cool because she gets two birthdays. She gets her birthday birthday, and she gets her adoption birthday, uh, which means double the cake, which is always cool for kids. And uh, the other day I was walking uh, to school, and um, she said, Daddy, uh, I'm double adopted, aren't I? I said, oh, well, that's interesting, what do you mean? Well, well I'm adopted into our family, but I'm also adopted into God's family. And I said, yes, I have a theologian nine-year-old. That's what I call cool. And uh, so she kind of understands her identity as best she can at her age. Um, the little lad in the middle, uh, with a big smile on his face, uh, he came into our lives. Um, we got a, a call from the social services. Um, him, his mum, and his dad, refugees from Ethiopia. Um, his dad had a lot of trauma in his life and so uh, there was a pretty tragic domestic violence incident involving this dad's mum and dad. Um, dad violently attacked mum in his presence. There was lots of blood and everything. Uh, dad got arrested. Mum got taken to a women's refuge with him and uh, while uh, mum was having racial reconstruction surgery after the attack, he came to live with us. And uh, he was amazing, had a massive smile, big heart, and um, he knew all the words and all the moves to a song called Moves Like Jagger by Maroon and Fife. And uh, you're probably all familiar with him, I can see you nodding here, yeah, that's good. Um, anyway, he would bust out those moves yeah. at, at the most appropriate, but also at the most inappropriate times. We could be travelling on a train or a bus or whatever, and he just can't stop. Bust them out. And um, he taught me the moves, but my children say it wouldn't be helpful to anyone if I showed you because uh, I am good at dad dancing. Uh, which I didn't know was a thing, you know, I, I just thought I was dancing, but apparently it was dad dancing. And the last little I'll tell you about um, is right there, just tucked down, and he's very small, and we couldn't fit everybody's faces in unless he was just a little small. Uh, up there, he came into our lives on 4.45 on Friday afternoon. Has anyone had um, any contact or work for um, social services or family? Yeah, okay. So 4.45 on a Friday afternoon. You know what that means, don't you? Okay. That means absolutely desperate social workers. Because the office is going to close in 15 minutes and they need somewhere for a vulnerable child to be. And if they don't find somewhere like a family, these kids are going to end up either in a hospital ward, and apparently here you might actually put people up in a, in a hotel uh, which is pretty tragic, and you're bringing um, just not necessarily trained people, not necessarily uh, you know, family people, just you know everyday people to kind of supervise the children. Okay, that's not good. It's not right. And uh, so we get people for you. Could you please make another place? Okay. What can you tell us about him? They said, Well, can't, we can't tell you much. All we can tell you is. He's a biter. <laughs> That's not what you want to hear. Let's be clear about that, okay? Biter. What does he bite? Does he bite things? I could live with that. You know, a few teeth marks on some furniture, not a big deal. Or does he bite people? If he bites people, that's a big deal, isn't it? Uh, because, you know, what's he being exposed to? Is that going to be safe for the rest of my family? I've, I've got a fatherly responsibility to make sure that they're going to be okay. But then, Jared can helpfully introduce to me and say that I have two jobs. I, I do have two jobs. I, I lead an adoption charity called Home for Good, but I also lead a theological college. And uh, it's called the London School of Theology, the finest theological college in North West London. And a uh, great place to do your doctoral research if you're thinking that. Anyway, so um, the theological part of my brain began to kick in when they said the word biter. Because you know that theologically speaking, biter is an inadequate description of a human person, isn't it? You and I are more than the worst thing we've ever done. Isn't that right? When God looks at you, of course he sees that we've, we've sinned against him, we've failed his standards, we haven't lived as we want to do. He sees all that. But he doesn't just see that sin. He also sees someone made in the image of God. Someone worthy of love and respect and compassion and care. God sees someone worth rescuing. And 
And so for me to look at this lad and only see him as a writer is theologically incorrect, unacceptable for a Christian person to live this way. And so we invited him and uh, he turned our lives upside down in all the best ways. Um, he bit a lot of things, mainly food, loads of food. Uh, he didn't bite any people. But we found out that by the time he was two and a half, he had eight homes. Okay, eight homes at two and a half. Uh, is there any wonder why he might resort to biting? But he doesn't know who he is or where he's from, where, or how his life fits, in, fits together. So in he came. And uh, I remember um, there was one time uh, I had to, well, I left my phone on a train. Always leaving stuff behind in place. I left it on a train. And the station master at the next uh, station had, hand, had, had handed in and he'd phoned me to say, could you come pick up your phone? <coughs> um, and this little lad, as far as we know, had never been on a train before. So he said, come on, let's, let's go together. And uh, so he came with me. Uh, it's his first train journey. He stood on the seat, which if you know in the end of the UK, that's not allowed. But anyway, I was with him. And uh, he pressed his nose against the window and he just shouted everything he could see. Bus, tree, car, sheep, bridge, car, faster, faster, faster! And he was just loving every second of it. And everyone on the, in the carriage was in absolute hysterics because he was having so much fun. It was only an 11 minute journey. I think they, you know, they might have run a bit thin after you know, 12 minutes maybe. But 11 minutes was okay. And uh, to be honest with you, I, I nearly burst into to, to dance moves from uh, room 5. But inside, I was singing. I was so happy for him. We knew all about his background. We knew what he'd been experiencing. And to see the joy busting out of him was just, just a delight. And it reminded me of a passage in the book of Zephaniah, you probably know it. He says that God rejoices over us with singing. And you think, why, why, why God would you do that? You don't need us. Uh, you know, you're, you're completely happy in yourself. You've got lots of things to entertain you. You've got galaxies and solar systems and, and supernovas. But you rejoice over us with singing. Why do you do that? Why, why when we failed you, we broken human beings, why do you rejoice over us with singing? You love seeing us flourish and grow and become all that we could be. And I got a little taste of that on 1611 from Haddon and St. Parkway uh, to Bristol North. I'm having a God moment on a train. For lots of people you think you're supposed to have a God moment in a beautiful church building like this with surround sound or, or maybe with uh, you know, a, a church that's got uh, the organ playing or maybe when you're breaking the sacraments or uh, when someone's being baptized when you're repeating liturgy. I want to tell you that those things are beautiful and right and good, but they're not the essence of worship. They're not the essence of worship. God's really clear about what kind of worship he likes. There's a verse that goes through the kind of adoption community. It's an important one. I'll just quote it to you. It says this, James chapter 1, verse 27. True religion that God our Father accepts as pure and blameless is. How does, how does that verse end? True religion that God our Father accepts as pure and blameless is. Perfect theology, brilliant singing, wonderful liturgy, stained glass. No. True religion that God our Father accepts as pure and blameless is to care for widows and orphans in their district. Why does God make that the basis of true worship? It's almost like he forgot about church and clericalism and you know, uh, the, the typical pietistic stuff that we kind of attribute to worship. I, I bet I haven't checked it out, but if you go over to the, 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 the library over there and you put out a book about worship, I bet it doesn't even mention it. I bet it's about singing. I bet it's about prayer and meditation. All good things. The Bible teaches those as good things. But why does he put this at the top of the list to care for widows and orphans? It's because what you do for, for the vulnerable, what you do for a person made in the image of God, is a reflection of how you feel about God. Let me give you a for instance. It's quite high up, so it might be difficult, but imagine at the end of my talk, a few of you feel uh, the urge to come forward, and you stand on the stage, and you have to be 
good at this, but you spit on my picture. Guys, it's just a picture. It's just a few pixels being, you know, spread across uh, some cable and then projected onto a switch. It's just a picture. It's not a thing in itself, is it? But what you do to the image of my children is an indication of what you do against them themselves. Does that make sense? So what you do or don't do for someone made in the image of God is a reflection of how you feel about God himself. So if we leave the vulnerable still vulnerable, we've done something against God himself. Are you with me? I want to show you just a little passage from the Bible for a minute, and then um, we'll kind of progress on with our evening. Um, if you've got a Bible, well done, good idea, to bring your Bible to a church event. Uh, if you haven't, uh, you can use the digital one that might be on your phone. Uh, or if, if you've got amazing eyesight, it's going to come up on the screen. So um, have you got, if you can't read it, it's your own fault for not bringing a Bible. Yeah. All right, um, so this is from the book of Galatians, chapter 4. And this is Paul writing to explain to a church there uh, a group of believers, some from Jewish backgrounds, some from Gentile backgrounds. He's explaining to them. Um, why they don't need to be circumcised. Okay? Something I, I rejoice over as often as I can. It is, um, here's how it goes. What I am saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave. Although he owns the whole estate, the heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were underage, we were enslaved under the elemental spiritual forces of this world. All right, just think about this for a minute. Um, Paul is saying whether you were a Jew and you were under the slavery of the law, or whether you were a Gentile and you were under the slavery of the elemental spiritual forces, we were all like vulnerable children in need. Okay? We were, we were in captivity. We, we needed release. But God didn't leave us that way. He saw us, He saw the challenge, He saw our, our, the mess we've got ourselves in. And he did something. You see what it says? But when the time set had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. You can have a little bit of homework in here, so listen carefully. Just at the right time, God the Father commissions the Son, Jesus, to come into the world. And it's like a, a massive dive, like an arc of a dive, isn't it? God is enjoying the glory of heaven, God, Father, and Holy Spirit. And then he sends Jesus into the world. And he comes into the world and he's, he's born of a woman. He's, he's human and mortal like us, even though he's divine. Um, and, and, and not only that, he's born under the power of the Lord. And, and, and what does Jesus do? He, he's coming on this mission, this rescue mission, in order to break us out of the captivity slavery to sin and the law. That's what he did. We didn't do it. He did it for us. It wasn't, wasn't because we were brave enough or clever enough or, or, or good enough. God did it because even though we were in it, he did all the work. Okay? And he did it so that we might be redeemed. Now look, you might have heard quite a lot about the idea of redemption. You were a slave and you've been set free. You might have heard a lot about forgiveness, that, that you and I were sinners and we failed God's standards, but God forgives us. You might have heard a bit about justification, that God justifies us, he treats us as if we'd never sinned because of what Jesus did. Um, and you might have heard God talk about rescue. Those are common ways that we preachers and evangelists talk about the gospel. And they're good ways, they're true ways. But that isn't where this passage goes. He says the purpose for God redeeming us was that we would be adopted. Now here's your homework, are you ready? It's not too complicated. If, if you do this well, you, you'll, you'll be head and shoulders about Vancouver churches who may have slightly cooler, although not quite as big thrift stores as you guys. Um, but they did not bad in this. I'm looking for a benchmark of three, an answer of three. Okay. What does adoption give you? your relationship with God, that forgiveness, redemption, justification, rescue, doesn't give you. Does that make sense? The normal ways we hear the gospel preached, this is our adoption. What does 
this is an option to be given a relationship with God. That these other ways of thinking about the gospel that God can give you. Have a little chat with your neighbour. If you don't have a neighbour, scooch up and find a neighbour. And um, if you don't like talking to other people, um, feel free to meditate on your own. That's okay too. Uh, but you know, it's a bit of fun. Get chatting. Um, there's no there's no prizes except for maybe some squares, but I will set this group against this group. Okay, so there's there's honor as well. There we go. Okay, the ladies at the front have got three already. Okay, so you guys better be on your map. You all set? You ready? Come on. Okay, do your best. And, um, Let's start over here, because we know these guys have got three, okay? So I'm giving you a head start just to see if you can name one of them before they do. Um, what does adoption give you in a relationship with God? That our normal way of thinking of gospel doesn't get it. Brilliant, really good one. Right at the end, uh, it says, uh, so you are no longer a slave, but God's a child, and since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Okay, that is fantastic. Uh, in the Romans equivalent of this passage, Romans chapter 8, it says that we become co-heirs with Christ. Okay? Now what is Jesus' inheritance? Oh, only the whole of creation. And so to be a co-heir with Christ is pretty amazing. I can't even get my head around how cool it is. Um, now look, for me, um, we, we, had a, we had a good, good uh, dinner here today. Jared very kindly brought us some pizza. Okay? And um, just me and Wendy, uh, for the purpose of that, we shared it. And um, Wendy does not have a large appetite. She, she must have had like two pieces of pizza. And I had the rest. <laughs> that was so cool. Now, if we were back at my house, okay, um, it used to just be like that for me and my wife, you know. I'd have, I'd have a, she'd have a thin, kind of a cute angle of a pizza, and I'd have the obtuse angle that was the rest of the pizza. And, you know, fair's fair, right? Now, I'm lucky to get a breath, a sniff of the pizza with my family. The more kids we have, the less there is to go around. The inheritance is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. I've met here, and this is sad, okay, I've met grandparents who when, um, sorry, parents who when their children um, decide they're going to adopt. Uh, so friends of mine in South Africa, they have both children and then there's a huge AIDS crisis. Um, and so they, they've adopted into their family and a child whose mum and dad died and uh, they've adopted her uh, into their family. The grandparents said, that adopted child is not my rules. So don't expect them to get any inheritance. How painful is that? Now look, I could get quite upset about the slice of my pizza getting smaller and smaller and smaller, you know? But imagine Jesus has ruled over me. All of creation is mine. I, I deserve it. I'm the tr only true and living um, you know, birth son, if you want to use that kind of language, that, that God ever had. I'm the eternal word of God. Why would I want to share that creation with these sinful, broken people? Imagine Jesus had thought like the older brother in the prodigal son story. Do you remember that one? Remember when he says, you know, this son of yours is wasting your inheritance, or my inheritance, with wild living. And he resents it. But do you remember what the father says? No, this brother of yours, he was dead, but now he's alive. Come and rejoice. Jesus is the best older brother you could ever hope for, isn't he? That he's, he delights to share with you all of the inheritance. And in fact, it cost him. It cost him his death on a cross, his resurrection from the dead in order to make it possible for people. So we get inheritance. That's good, really good answer. Well done to this side.
call you side one. Okay, how about side two? How are you guys doing? What have you got something? Yeah. Family, very good. So look, through adoption, we are adopted into God's family. Um, and, and that is very different from the way that you might think about other modes of adoption, uh, of, of forgiveness. So, so let me give you an illustration. So you, half of you have never met me before, we have no relationship. Okay, so before tonight, we were relationally at zero. Is that, is that fair? Never met before, we don't know each other, relationally zero. And then I've told you that I've turned up at an event that you come to this evening wearing thrift store clothes. That you might find that very offensive. And so we're now, because you're offended, at minus 10. Are you with me? But well, you look like a gracious bunch of people. I hope you are. We've been giving you squares and free, free water. Although, you know, forgiveness isn't earned at minimum. Um, and you might choose to forgive us, or forgive me, for my clothes, quite not What we have now, we're at zero again. Forgiveness does not necessarily generate a relationship. It doesn't make you family. You're bank manager, okay? Imagine at the end of your mortgage, okay? You have a debt, and I then, who have a lovely, gracious bank manager says he's gonna write it off, will you pay it off? After the debt is paid, how's your relationship? You, you'll never see that bank manager ever again, will you? So, forgiveness does not automatically give you a relationship. But adoption does, God becomes your father. All right, good, one each. Side one, back to you. You got any more? Okay, you get intimacy with God. That is huge, isn't it? Um, that's different to a rescue metaphor. Okay? Yeah, let's try this one. Has anyone ever been rescued by uh, a paramedic or the ambulance service? Has, that, has, has the ambulance ever been able to help us? You have? Yeah? Um, what's the name of your ambulance driver? Are yeah. <coughs> you still in regular contact? Exchange Christmas cards? Has he been around your house? Been out for dinner? No, I mean, maybe he could have saved your life. But that doesn't necessitate a relationship, does it? Many people treat God that way. You know, oh, you know, my life was okay, and then I had a crisis. And I prayed, and, you know, I became a Christian, and I felt bad, and, and then God, God forgave me, and He rescued me, and we're back to zero again. And, you know, that's it. I don't, I don't really want to know Him, I don't want to honor Him, I'm just going to ignore Him. Does that make sense? So, for some people, Christianity is a get out of hell free card, you know, like in the game of Monopoly. You don't actually use the get out of jail free card until someone sends you to jail. For some people, Christianity is, well, you know, Things get bad, if I die, at least I've got a prayer to prayer, I've been to church a few times, I've got christened, and I'll be okay. That is not the essence of the Christian faith. God rescued you so that you would be adopted into his family, that you might have intimacy with the Father. Great, well done. Uh, two, one, your turn. Any others? You got any more? Is that it? Big brother? Oh, we've had the brother. Not that kind of big brother, but I know what you mean. So this intimacy with God it is an incredible status that we have, isn't it? So we talked about God the Father, sending God the Son, and now the God, God the Spirit confirms in our heart that we can call God Abba Father, which is a term of great affection. Now look, um, I, I got to visit one time um, the southern part of this continent, uh, the USA. And uh, when I went to, um, I went to Washington, and I got to go to the White House. Tour. And if you've ever seen West Wing, it's a lot smaller than it is in West Wing. And um, there was the Oval Office, okay, and there's a kind of big barricade across it, but I managed to put my foot, just the toe of it, into the Oval Office. No one else was in there, but my foot was being in there. You know, I stepped, I put a quarter of my foot in that, the Oval Office, that's pretty cool. Because you think, you can't normally get in there, can you? And you definitely can't get in there when the President's in there. Can you imagine the 1960s that you've got you know, John F. Kennedy meeting with the Premier of 
the Soviet Union, the Cuban Missile Crisis is going off, there's huge security guards built by outside laboratories on the outside um, of the Oval Office, they're not going to let just anyone in. Access is barred. But there's this amazing picture in Life magazine. And it's got John F. Kennedy um, you know, signing some documents on the desk in the Oval Office, and then at his feet, there's a little boy playing with a train. It was John Jr. How come he's an addict? Because that's his daddy. And because that's his daddy, he's got access, he's got intimacy, he's got status. Friends, you only get that through adoption. If you call God your father, you are adopted into God's family. Okay, but why are we so long this? I want you to know that adoption is not just a fringe interest for certain people, uh, certain Christians who are wired a certain way. Adoption is the core of our gospel message. Um, Jim Packer, J.I. Packer, you know, local mega theologian, he argued that adoption is the highest privilege that a Christian can ever enjoy. And yet we don't sing about it, we don't teach about it, we don't pray about it, we don't talk about it. I'm on a mission to rehabilitate the doctrine of adoption. Because I want you to know that the honour and joy and privilege that you've got as a Christian. But I also want to soften your heart. Because if you're an adopted person, if you're a believer here tonight, then you're an adopted person. Your heart should be softened to children that are in need of adoption. It is what is how this logic works. In the UK, we have 6,000 children that are waiting for adoption. And yet we've got lots of adopters that are waiting for children. Okay? That's old. What is that about? Bureaucracy sometimes. But that's not the main problem. The main problem is that these adopters don't want these kinds of children. They want babies. And these kids that are waiting for adoption, they're not babies. They're older children. Older means two or three plus. They've got additional needs, some of them. They come from black and minority ethnic backgrounds, some of them. They come with siblings. 70% of them have experienced neglect or abuse. These adopters don't want these kinds of children. I'll tell you why in general, and I'm, I'm, I'm really not trying to be mean at all, I'm trying to understand. Most of the people coming forward for adoption in the UK are coming because of fertility reasons. And when you're coming because of fertility reasons, you really want a baby. I totally understand that. Babies are absolutely amazing. But we're trying to say to the church that adoption is not just the third worst way of having a child. That's the public imagination. That's true outside the church, and it's true inside the church too. For many people, there's, there's natural birth. That's the best way to have a baby and, or a child. And if that doesn't work, for some Christians, they need to do the IVF route. Okay, if that doesn't work, well, there's always adoption for the last possible means. And I understand. That, that, that's completely understandable. But if we're not careful, we're missing something. Because look, when God adopted you and me, it wasn't because he needed to. There wasn't something missing in God. It wasn't that God was lonely, or upset, or unfulfilled. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, perfect relationship. There's nothing wrong with it. God didn't adopt us because he needed him. God adopted us because we needed him. Does that make sense? It was the compassion of God, not the need of God, that drove adoption. Now, a Christian approach to adoption is different. It's saying we're going to model the adopting grace of God towards these children that are in need. This, in the end, is not about us getting the children we want. If we're not careful, that's consumerism. These children are over there for us. They're a means to an end. They're going to meet our needs, make us feel better, make us feel nicer about ourselves. That's spending a lot of weight on some kids. Kids are an end means to an end. Kids are making an image of God, a precious gift. This is not about us getting the kids that we want, it's about these kids getting the families that they need. And when you see it like that, a whole bunch of other people can consider becoming adopters. Not just people who can't have their own children. People that can't have their own children, they could be brilliant adopters. They could be brilliant adopters if they're willing to open their hearts a bit wider. And be the parents that maybe a two or a three year old needs rather than just thinking about babies. But 
the rest of us could be great adopters too. You might be married and you might already have kids, your kid might have flown the nest. You might be single. I don't know, I don't know this church. So here is, here's, if you think I'm getting more heretical, I think it's better that a, that a child has at least one parent that really loves them than they have no one going parents in their lives. And if you're a bit nervous, there may well be biblical warrant. What was the name of Esther's mother? Queen Esther, do you remember? We know the name of her adopted dad, Mordecai. No mention of her mother. It's very likely that Mordecai was a single girl. And he raised her in it. Anyway, so if it becomes that way around, we become the parents of these children need then we're more than something of the adopting grace of God. That's huge. Now guys, I told you in the UK we've got 6,000 waiting children. That is uh, a travesty. That is a, a blemish on the church's reputation in the UK. Because God's already told us that true religion that he accepts us, pure and blameless is to care for widows and orphans in need. But our, our church in the UK is turning a blind eye to these kids. They're in our neighbourhoods, they're in our schools, they're in our communities, but we don't care, we don't see them, they're invisible. Instead we cop out by caring for the vulnerable, by sending £20 a month to some kid around the world, and, and, and easing our consciences by supporting some other kids somewhere else. Friends, that's, that's not enough. That's like walking down the Jericho Road, seeing the man beating up over there, and saying, I'm not going to get involved in your life because I've already given £20 a month. I'm already tied in. I've done my job. Jesus said that was inadequate. To love our neighbours as we love ourselves. To leave these kids in care, we assign them, unless you know they break all the statistical norms, to a pretty rubbish life. In the UK, a massive percentage of the population of prisons are young men that have aged out of care. Massive percentage of our homeless population are kids that have aged out of care. In some areas, it's up to 70% of sex workers are young women that have aged out of care. Now, the church is getting better, okay? We're helping, we're in prisons, we're helping in prisons, brilliant. We're helping with the homeless, excellent. We're helping with people caught in the sex industry. That is amazing. That's really good. Because we could have, we could have a huge impact on these kids' lives, but not when they're 25 and they're addicted to drugs. When they were three and four, they needed a family. Now, I can't promise you that if you get involved, it will be a happy ending. I can't promise that at all. I can't promise you that, that they'll all turn into Anna of Green Gables or the kids from Despicable Me. There's, there's kind of rose colored glasses on adoption at the moment in the, kind of, in the media. So, I'm not promising you that everyone's going to turn out just fine. That the scars that these kids have, sometimes on the outside, but always on the inside. Don't go away. Sometimes ever. And our job is to love them anyway. So I'm, I'm delighted that we've got agencies here tonight that want to make a difference into this space. To say to Canada and the Canadian church, come on. And let's end the waiting. There are 30,000 children in Canada that are waiting for adoption. You think it's bad in the UK? It is bad in the UK. But there are 62 million people in the UK. You have 30,000 children waiting for adoption here in Canada. What's your population? 35, 36 million? America's got more. They've got 100,000 children waiting for adoption. Okay? But how many people they got that live there? 500 million? 350 million. So, Canada, you could do better. And by God's grace, you will. If people like you get it in their bones that this matters to God, that you can make a noise about it in your church, use your voice on social media, use your, your energy to help promote this. You, you might want to be one that gets alongside another family that are fostering or adopted. That would really help them. You know, so many adopters do it despite the church, not because the church is with them. Imagine that you've got alongside them. And I don't just mean give them extra baffle on Mother's Day and then say, well done. But ongoing support. We've heard of people that have said, you know what, Monday nights, whatever island you need doing in your house, we're going to take it away and do it, bring it back all nicely done. 
That's not commitment to come and help you. I've heard of other people that they call foster and adoptive grandparents who say, okay, whoever's in my house on Thursday night, they come down for us uh, for pizza, and if there's an appropriate movie, we'll go to the cinema. You can have a night off, and we will do the support work. Those kind of little interventions make a big deal difference. But friends, some of you would be great adoptive parents. Some of you have got room in your home and room in your hearts to actually be the adoptive parents of these kids need. And there are people here tonight that can help you in the next steps of that. I'm going to say a little prayer and then I'm going to hand over to Jack. If, if you want to join in, uh, you might just want to put your hand out to say to God, hear it. Father God, we are grateful that you adopted us. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. You did it because you're a gracious, wonderful, loving God. Thank you that when you looked at us, you didn't just see the worst thing we've ever done. You didn't write us off as a hopeless and helpless sinner. You saw us as people worth rescuing, worth forgiving, worth justifying, worth redeeming, but most of all worth adopting. But we're grateful for that grace. And we pray that somehow these 30,000 waiting children in Canada would know something of that grace in their lives. They would know the love of a secure and stable family that will love them whatever the cost, whatever, whatever stuff is going on in their lives, whatever decisions they make, they would know that they had unconditional love from the family that took them as they were. We pray that you would make us part of the solution to this massive issue in our nation. In Jesus' name.